let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Matt Siegel, and those of you who are joining us for the second or third time um, won't need an introduction for Tim, but I'm going to go ahead and give one anyway and provide a little bit of uh, the format for today. So um, in a moment, I'll introduce uh, Tim Eastman, and he will speak to us for about 20 minutes about chapter three of his book. Um, he's going to lay out his baker's dozen uh, of Gordian knot problems and then provide us with the solutions um, from his book, Untying the Gordian Knot. We've had um, some really uh, deep conversation that we, uh, you know, will probably continue some of today and in subsequent sessions um, with, with the first two chapters of this book. And today we have two guests to uh, enter into dialogue with Tim following his uh, introduction. We have uh, Dr. Michael Epperson, as well as Dr. Ruth Kastner, and I'll introduce each of them uh, when it is their turn to share some reflections. And then after we hear from our, uh, our guests or our panelists, there might be a little bit of back and forth between them and Tim for 10 or 15 minutes, but we're gonna have uh, at least, um, I would say an hour and 15 or so for um, open dialogue questions from our other participants who are here. And so if questions come up while you're listening to Tim or either of the respondents, don't hesitate to drop them into the chat and when it comes time for the open discussion and, and Q&A, I will uh, call on you to ask your question yourself, or if you'd like, I can just read it. All right. <clears throat> so um, Dr. Tim Eastman was, uh, is a space plasma physicist, did a lot of uh, research um, for the National Science Foundation and NASA on space plasmas and space physics for over 25 years. More recently, he has turned his attention to some of these deep philosophical issues uh, with quantum theory in particular. And um, he's had a longstanding interest in process thought, uh, was guest editor of Process Studies uh, in the late 90s, has published a great book, co-edited a book uh, with Hank Eastman, sorry, uh, Hank Keaton, <laughs> excuse me, uh, called Physics and Whitehead. I know that book was very helpful to me and his latest book, uh, Untying the Gordian Knot, is really um, stretching my conceptual imagination in all the right ways. And so um, I'll hand it off to you, Tim, to continue to lead us into this important work in the philosophy of physics. Uh, please. Well, well, thank you, Matt. Uh... And, and uh, I, I understand, you know, you can hear me, is that, uh, okay. Well, anyway, you can see uh, in the backdrop here, I've got a number of books uh, and that's so to speak is symbolic, uh, so to speak a semiotic pointer to the fact that I have leveraged a tremendous amount of great scholarship over the past uh, century plus, uh, and especially in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of progress in some of these various issues that I've uh, utilized that material. And, and you can see in the book that there's extensive references as well as a quite a few uh, suggested readings that relate to what I, my synthesis. So I'm somewhat of a, uh, well, I'm, I'm a synthesis person. That's what I ended up being pretty good at. There's various failings of mine, especially in trying to do uh, mathematical analysis or the more kind of like uh, routine things that you might think a scientist is really good at. I tend not to be quite as good at, but when it comes to sort of leveraging and synthesizing, uh, I, I, I tend to be pretty good at that. Uh, now, um, I also have had the good opportunity to uh, encounter and be in dialogue with a number of really great uh, philosophers and scientists over the years. Uh, uh, John Cobb and uh, others among among them, uh, and so I really appreciate uh, the uh, Cobb Institute being part of this. And uh, the uh, uh, and and I know Mike Epperson was key in organizing a number of uh, dialogues in the two uh, thousands uh, up until around uh, two two thousand ten or so. Uh, that uh, Henry Staff was part of that. Uh, Stu, Stu Kaufman, uh, David Finkelstein, a number of uh, 
uh, key philosophers. Uh, so that was, those are some intense dialogues that I had the opportunity to participate in. And so that influenced me. Um, and then, um, so I've been working on these issues in the backdrop through my edited volumes and a few special issues and so forth for the last, uh, well, you know, well, 20 to 30 years. Uh, so, so my book is like he's pulling together all these pieces and the um, Gordian Knot to Logoi framework, my chapter three is an attempt to sort of set out the whole scheme uh, based upon that synthesis. And I must say that I, uh, that, that, that the, the key uh, inspiration for it uh, comes out of recent developments in uh, the quantum theory of measurement, of understanding quantum physics. Now, quantum physics isn't my field as such, uh, but it is a field of very special interest and special scholarship of our guest, uh, Dr. Ruth Kastner and uh, Michael Epperson. And they both have been a great inspiration to me. And uh, I've just, uh, I, I, and when I first encountered Ruth Kastner's work, uh, it, it, well, it really goes back to University of Maryland when uh, she, she finished a doctorate under Jeff Boob. Uh, but then uh, for many years, I kind of was in other things and not paying attention to it. And then later on, I, I re, you know, read her uh, work of uh, about 2006 or so and really thought it most interesting, her way of framing the possibilist approach her possibilist interpretation of the transactional interpretation of John Kramer. And then I read something by John Kramer who said that he didn't think that Ruth's material really went beyond what he had. He didn't quite understand what Ruth was up to entirely. And then I was puzzled by that because it struck me as being a major advance. Well, then it's now more recently occurred to me why it is that John Kramer didn't really appreciate Ruth's material. And that is, I think John Kramer was basically presupposing a certain actualism, a certain actualist position, uh, as I have framed it in my book. That is, that the, that the uh, logic, of actual, uh, logic of actuality, I make the distinction of a logic of actuality versus a logic of possible relations or logic of potentia. So I take this as foundational in what I'm doing, this distinction among the real broadly understood of the actual and the possible. And associated with that would be a logic of the actual, a Boolean logic and a logic of the possible, a non-Boolean logic. And that's affirming what uh, Ruth uh, called attention to as being a possibilist interpretation of the quantum physics. And so, I think what happened here is that uh, John Kramer, the initiator of the transactional interpretation, really didn't appreciate, he, he just simply presupposed actualism in a certain way. He didn't realize what a profound uh, enhancement it is of the transactional interpretation to then fully lay on the table this possibilistic framing of it. And um, so when I went back more recently before as I was writing my book to read her two books, uh, I would just say, this is, this is great. And, uh, and really weaves into uh, other material that I've been following uh, by Mike Epperson and Elie Safiris who presented last time about looking at quantum physics from the point of view of a theory of relations, the new mathematics of category theory, which helps to technically understand the uh, way to handle uh, the quantum physics and quantum the theory of measurement uh, in, a, in, a, in a way consistent with the latest developments in quantum physics, but also to affirm the need for a distinction of a logic of actual versus a logic of the possible. That is that, that, uh, that in the quantum physics, is reflected something that in our intuition, as I discussed uh, in the last session, maybe in the first session, that intuitively we have a sense that when we're traveling by our car down the road and we're mapping out different, we're, we're anticipating, we're mapping out different alternative possibilities. There's an alternative possibility that I could accidentally and wrongly turn my wheel in a way that could cause a terrible accident. And that possibility would be devastating. You know, I, I would be, I would be, I could be killed for such a mistake. So then we're constantly 
laying out in our minds, so to speak, alternative possibilities. And we're selecting constantly among those alternative possibilities. So those alternative possibilities have a certain type of actuality. They're, we're, 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 we're modeling systems, we're anticipating those sets of possibilities and we're selecting among them actively. And so those, the, those potential relations that, that, that they're having, a, that, they're, that they're part of the real broadly understood. Uh, even though when you look at the sequence of potential actual outcomes and measurements and do just correlations in some space-time framework of those outcomes, then you'll not necessarily make any reference to possibility as such. And then perhaps you'll infer that is simply a mind-like characteristic or something that just comes out of your sub subject predicate language or uh, in some way is just an epistemic issue. Uh, but in contrast to that, I would say that the distinction of the actual and the possible among the real is, is really ontologically grounded in an important way that, it, that it's not simply some epistemic thing. It's uh, that it's, it's more than just uh, issues of, of, uh, of simple binary input outputs that there's always a, uh, for, for any input output relation, there's always a context. There's always a, uh, as, as we say in the quantum physics and experiments of uh, there, uh, there's always a measurement context. And so if you think in terms of this kind of a logical triad of input output context as being pervasive um, in, uh, with, without limit, and that that is correlated with a distinction of the actual and the possible and the possible relations are always there as a backdrop to providing context if, if you don't identify anything else. And, and further that this kind of set of relations has is consequence at multiple levels at, at local and global levels and everything in between. So, so what I've tried to, tried to do in my, my uh, relational framework, uh, I call it logoi framework as a pointer to the notion of relations in a broad sense, uh, logoi framework, uh, that by pulling these two elements together of the distinction of the actual and the possible among the real, the uh, local global relations that arise in a category theoretic interpretation of quantum physics uh, that Mike Epperson and Elias Zephyrus uh, emphasize in identifying the way in which the uh, transactions, the weaving of the world that happens in the quantum physics uh, in a way that Ruth Kastner brings out and the inevitable triadic relations and sort of a more semiotic framing of things. Uh, and then just putting these pieces together is uh, how I have then brought to bear on these uh, uh, so-called Gordian knots. Uh, now, when I first put together the set of Gordian knots and I ended up with 13 of them, uh, my wife, Carolyn, who's next to me, uh, Carolyn, come here. So see, she, she liked, no. she, she, yeah, she, she liked the, uh, the, you know, the phrase, the, uh, 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 untying the Gordian knot. And I had a subtitle, I was thinking of the title of process, reality and context and da da da. da. And then she said, oh no, that's, that's not a good enough title. So we, we latched on that title. And at the time I was thinking that I would be writing the entire book about with a focus on how one addresses each one of these and that would be the book. Well, that's where I was thinking two, three, four years ago. Well, as it evolved, I realized I couldn't do it that way. I had to look at the cross-cutting issues. And so effectively now the eight chapters are looking at the cross-cutting issues, uh, things like causation and emergence and semiotics and so forth uh, that, uh, that are part of this weaving. And I didn't initially intend it to be this kind of highly speculative, radically integrative, uh, uh, overly ambitious uh, system I put together. I, I just I, I just got backed into it. You know, 
uh, and uh, just got backed into it. I couldn't, I, I couldn't avoid it. Ultimately, I, I tried to avoid it, but I got sucked into it. Um, in my scientific papers, mind you, is the radical contrast. I tried to identify a very specific problem, and how do I very, you know, in a concise way, solve a specific focused problem? And Whitehead was much like that. He tried to see everything in terms of specific problems and how do you identify and solve specific problems. And he got backed into this more uh, broader framing. Well, as you can see in my book on uh, the first time I lay it out on, in chapter three, page 66, is the Gordian knot of problems, the 13 uh, problems of measurement, potentiality, continuity, temporality, causal relations, law, how do we understand physical law, emergence, information and knowledge, induction, access, that is the abstract realms of logic, what do we mean by that, the matter symbol, symbol problem, uh, that is, what's the relationship of knower and known, the mind-body problem, and the problem of meaning. So, um, at first, I, I I I knew that I had to grapple with these, but then, um, in some way, and I, I sort of, you know, of course, early on, I wasn't even going to attempt such a thing. But then, when I realized that there was this way to cleanly and dis well to formally distinguish not just the fact of within the real that there's a lot that the actual and the possible that that there's a personal say intuitive experiential distinction of the actual and the possible but there is a counterpart in that experience in that human immediate experience in the quantum physics of a need for distinguishing them by virtue of the distinction of the boolean and the non-boolean the actual and the possible, the logic of the actual and the logic of the possible. And further that at the ground of, of the quantum field theory, things are fundamentally relational. Uh, it's not a theory about particular isolated substances in some classical physics way. It, it's fundamentally a theory about uh, relational event, uh, relations of event sequences. Uh, so if you take that position that ultimately that is the nature of the world at all levels without limit and that there's a distinction of the actual impossible and that there's a corresponding logic with that then I did that one additional hypothesis and said uh, suppose that the fundamental that their fundamental lot orders that the fundamental order uh, that there's you know it's coextensive with our experience coextensive with our reality is this fundamental order of the a logic of the actual, the Boolean order and a non-Boolean order. And they're embedded in our reality at all levels and at all times without limit. Then, then when I went back to read Rose Cashner's material about the transactional interpretation, I said, oh my goodness, wow, this makes sense now. Uh, before I was having trouble understanding it. Uh, and then I went back to uh, Mike Epperson's and stuff aha, wow, this is a way of understanding what they're doing in terms of the Boolean non-Boolean that now makes sense in a new way. And then I went back to several of these issues of temporality and continuity and so forth. This is, I realized that there's a new way of understanding each and each, each of these. That then I work at laying out in the book that some, I had come across a key but just pulling together all these elements of what all these, the great work all these people are doing, pulling it together, and it seemed like a key to resolve a whole, you know, or at least a route to resolve a number of un outstanding issues. So that's why I call it the the, the Gordian knot and untying, untying the Gordian knot. Uh, I I just happened to be somebody who tripped over that uh, uh, that set of possibilities, uh, but the the pieces are right there. And were to a significant extent uh, addressed in various ways by many key scholars out there. And I want to call attention to one, especially that Ruth Kastner pulled together a coordination between herself and Mike Epperson and Stu Kaufman. And they did a joint paper that was published in the International Journal for uh, Fundamental uh, Physics uh, that pulled, and she may mention that. 
So uh, I want to thank uh, her and Mike and the others, uh, the scholars that uh, just pulling together uh, can in a new way understand some of these uh, outstanding issues in a way that I think really goes beyond where we were with uh, 20th century, say analytic philosophy and so forth. Analytic philosophy provides very good tools epistemologically and methodologically for addressing problems in philosophy, but they're developed, so to speak, in ontology with the some some in the analytic tradition. There was really an ontology that was based on, so to speak, in broadly classical physics or a classical metaphysics. And I, th I think that's, and then they tended to get into nominalism or simply saying that the, that, that the world is nothing but sets of particulars and propositions are about those particulars and that's that's the whole game. Uh, and in certain parts of say uh, European tradition, uh, getting into phenomenology and uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, in a different approach to the linguistic issues, then they they tended to uh, sort of uh, inspired by Kant get into uh, just subtle philosophic issues about the uh, the uh, linguistic relations and so forth, and getting further away from somehow talking about the the reality of things. So, um, in in contrast, never I, even though I draw on phenomenology and semiotics and several of the European traditions, uh, and I uh, then ultimately I want to say, as many scientists do, that there is a real world out there, and there's we do have some access to it, uh, but it's 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 uh, it's it's it, it's uh, it's not an easy one. We have direct access to actualizations, the things we directly measure, but we only have indirect access to uh, the the non-Boolean realm, the order of potentia. Uh, so it's implicit. It's so to speak indirect. We sense it, but we don't. It's not. It's not there in the direct outputs. It's so to speak implicated um, and that the recognition of the implication is there in the quantum physics, but one has to do philosophic work. It's not just science, it's science and philosophy. And to assume it's reduces to nothing but science, scientific propositions per se, that is propositions about measurement outcomes and their correlation, then you have a limited view with respect to what space-time metric is, you have a limited view of what science is, and sometimes that leads to scientism, as I would say. But instead, if you recognize the these distinctions, it seems to me that's a way to really uh, add to the capability of the science and the philosophy together to address age-old problems of the mind-body problem, intentionality, and uh, and, and as well as issues of emotion and affect, as Thandeka has pointed out in a recent book about affect, the affective dimension. So I think there's promise for getting at those issues as well, well as the spiritual dimension by this alternate approach, which brings together a distinction of the actual and the possible, that is a logic of the actual versus a logic of the possible that then maps to, I hypothesize, a fundamental order of the actual that is coextensive with a fundamental order of potentia. Uh, and when you think in terms of that way, uh, then uh, it, it really changes how one thinks about the wor world uh, uh, in a way that becomes much more inclusive and uh, and, and open to uh, you know, alternate perspectives, but in a way that has a linkage to quite rigorous uh, scientific work as uh, will be brought out in subsequent comments by uh, my friends, uh, Ruth Kastner and Mike Epperson. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Tim. <clears throat> So um, now I have the privilege of introducing uh, Professor Ruth Kastner. She's a research associate in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Maryland. Uh, she's the author of this very important article that uh, Tim was just mentioning, and I've linked to that in the chat. 
Um, she's also the author of uh, a book on quantum theory, the transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics, the reality of possibility. Um, that's actually next on my list as soon as I finish uh, Tim Odlin's book here, I'm trying to do a deepen my knowledge of quantum uh, theory and the philosophy of physics. And so I very much look forward to reading your book and I'm sorry I haven't read it yet, but um, Ruth, as soon as you're ready, the floor is yours. Uh, I believe you can unmute yourself. There you go. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Tim. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Good, good. Um, I, I really enjoyed your uh, your comments, your opening comments, and I basically just wanted to kind of hold up a cigarette lighter and, you know, cheer. Uh, so it, it's um, some very important um, insights that you've been pulling together, I think, and, and um, present, you know, kind of doing a great job of, of presenting the, the global implications for how we need to rethink the way we approach science and uh, in in light of quantum theory and and uh, just you know uh, I applaud your your accomplishments and uh, what you're doing right now. Um, I guess I should just say that I came to these problems from a much more these challenges for, from a much more very narrow um, focus. So. I, uh, I kind of started out as a stodgy, you know, physicist person, and I would be among the first to debunk, you know, the woo, like Sam Harris likes to say woo, you know, to disparage uh, any, any kind of explorations that might go beyond the standard scientific actualist paradigm. So I was kind of one of those people, and, but I was also stubbornly realist about, about physics, and I, I believe that, uh, yeah, the only reason I'm interested in in physics is because I think we do learn about the world. I think that it it, it uh, theories work because they're telling us something about the way the world works. And um, so when I uh, you know started dealing with quantum theory and and the EPR uh, correlations and these kinds of strange phenomena, I it really grabbed me and I said, okay, there's something something new is going on here. Um, and and I, I appreciated your comments about, about John Kramer. Um, I think I, I really admire what he's done in, in developing TI, but I, I do think that he kind of got trapped in the usual, as an experimental physicist, I can understand he has that background where they've sort of been marinated in this view that space-time is a container for everything real. And it's, it's hard to kind of question that and, and get distance from it when that's so strongly embedded in your, your way of viewing the world. But what got me into thinking about the transactional interpretation as being about possibility is that I looked at these correlation situations, the entangled states, and these are states where you, you are dealing with um, you know, in traditional terminology, a configuration space that it has many dimensions. Now, I, I'm critical about the use of the configuration space because I don't think of the uh, uh, space-time parameters as really being uh, primary in a sense when you're describing quantum theory. But for purposes, for our purposes, basically, if you have n correlated quantum systems, you're you're dealing with a quantum state that lives in a three n dimensional space, or at least is described by a three n dimensional mathematical space you traditionally called configuration space. And, uh, you know, I feel as though Kramer wanted to not look at that aspect of it. But if you're going to be realist about quantum theory, then clearly this, these systems, these entangled states are composite entangled states that are not, uh, the, the different particles that are entangled are not separable and they don't have, they, you cannot think of them as each having their own little three-dimensional space and just living in that same space together. So if I wanted to be realist about quantum theory, I had to admit that there's this space that describes these systems, these correlated entangled systems that is much larger than it just doesn't fit into space-time. So. So clearly, you know, it's just a natural step. It's like, I, 
I cannot be consistent and say that these systems are hanging out in space time because that defies their mathematical description. And the mathematics is the, the theory that works so well and it, without it, we you know, wouldn't get anywhere. So if, if the theory is to in, be interpreted real, realistically, then that's just unavoidable. So what are these things? They're, they're possibilities. That's just the natural way to interpret them. So, so that's how I arrived at the possibilist approach to the transactional interpretation. Um, I guess the other thing that I want to highlight about, about the transactional picture is, is it really connects, uh, because it, it tells you what measurement is, which is, is a big lacuna in standard quantum theory. And that is, I have some more recent papers out where I dis discuss how um, the, the problem where we can't define measurement is because in traditional approaches to quantum theory, it's taken as only unitary, meaning that it only has a deterministic kind of process to it. And here I wanna agree also with Tim's uh, focus on process as very important. But the, the, the key aspect of the quantum realm, what I call the quantum substratum, because I do think of it as a, a substratum of possibility from which space-time actual, actualized events emerges. But what, but what we see in, in, in the transactional picture is that measurement is really this process of emergence. And as long as you're limited only to the unitary kinds of flow of dynamics, there's nothing. There's no process that qualifies as uh, anything that could transition from possibility to actuality. So what I what I would emphasize for our purposes of you know today's discussion, and it's obviously I, I may be almost out of time already, um, is that that TI kind of a TI transactional interpretation works with a different. A theory of field behavior, and it's very radically different. It is relational. It's a mutual um, interaction of fields that you you just don't get in the usual way of thinking about fields. And so this allows you to define measurement as a real process of actualization. So so the transactional picture, what it provides for you, is the missing link between the possible and the actual. That is measurement in quantum theory, and that's why standard quantum theory is, it has to be mute on measurement because it doesn't um, have the right dynamics of the field behavior. So there's nothing that can give you what you need, which is a non-unitary, the uh, kind of indeterministic uh, dynamics that you just won't get in standard quantum theory. So that's what you get from the transactional picture kind of in a nutshell. And that's where you get things like offers, offer waves and confirmation waves. These are aspects of this um, non-unitary process. It's a, it's a real physical process that allows these possibilities to then uh, emerge. And of course you also get a symmetry breaking because you have many more possibilities than can be actualized. So that's where you get a bunch of measurement outcomes where only one can be actualized. And that's where perhaps intentionality can come in. So that's kind of speculative, but um, you know, that's, I guess for our current purposes, um, what I guess another parallel I, I like to draw, I just recently became aware of work by Ian McGilchrist, who is a brain scientist and he does a lot of work um, looking at the the right brain and the left brain as these very different ways of knowing and operating and perceiving in the world. And I think of the, the right brain is more the intuitive global kind of uh, way of perceiving that is very much uh, analogous to the quantum relational realm. And then the left brain is much more um, uh, discursive, e Boolean logic, um, either or uh, kind of uh, way of perceiving and way of acting that is more the classical actualist realm. And I think of, you know, how our, br our brains have this, uh, you wonder how can they talk to each other? And it's the corpus callosum, which is this, uh, you know, part of the very narrow part of the brain that actually lets these two hemispheres communicate. I think of TI as the quantum analog of that, because it it gives you that missing link of connecting the 
possibilist quantum realm to the actualized emergent space-time realm. And it tells you how that happens in a very kind of clear physical way. So I don't know, I haven't been keeping track of the time. So I, I don't know how much longer you would like me to elaborate or whether you want to move on to. to my um, Ruth, if you, if you have something more you want to share that can fit okay. in a few minutes, um, please do. And then we'll move on to Michael. Okay. So um, I would, I would talk a little bit more, I think about the, um, the idea of, of relations um, and, you know, that is very applicable to the, the way the fields operate in the transactional picture, because it's based on, uh, the Wheeler-Feynman absorber theory, also known as the direct action theory of fields. And, uh, what this, this theory was, has a kind of a, a history that uh, makes a lot of people feel like, oh, it's not viable because it was, it was developed actually by uh, Tetrode and some other German scientists who don't get the, the, the credit they're due, uh, Sackler and Tetrode, I believe in the, uh, in the 19th century who were actually starting to look at this. And then Wheeler and Feynman picked it up. And the key thing about this theory is that it's very mutual it's very it's a it's it's um it's a a picture in which sources like electrons atoms charged any charged particle basically they they non-locally know about one another so that right away that's that's considered action at a distance and the notion of action at a distance is generally frowned upon in the traditional uh, physical paradigm that's considered to be, you know, woo. Okay, Every, you cannot have action at a distance. It's, it's, it's um, not physically valid, not scientifically valid. But the the direct action theory defies that, and it says no. There's an unmediated direct connection between these charges, these sources of the field, and there's a very clear physical um, theoretical uh, symbol. Uh, representation of that. It's just the time symmetric propagator. So there's a very quantitative theoretical object that describes this, but it is non-local. And so for that reason, it's been really uh, shoved under the rug by uh, orthodox researchers. And so that I think is where, where our challenge, you know, the many challenges of trying to bring forth this new paradigm, that's a major challenge because we have to uh, get beyond the usual prejudice, if I may use that pejorative term, that that any kind of field propagation has to be this sort of causal, what I call a bucket brigade. You know, it's got to be like going ooh, carefully from one space to, oh my God, don't spill any, oh my God, no, can't go too fast, you know. So that, we, we have to get beyond that because that is an actualist uh, metaphysics that's entirely optional. And in fact, it does apply very clearly and very nicely to the space-time manifold. Yes, everything it, that happens in space-time does that. But underlying that, if you allow that there is this quantum realm that's more fluid, that, it, that can be very uh, accurately and, and quantitatively described by quantum theory and by the direct action theory, it just doesn't work that way. And we already know we have non-local EPR connections and so on. So we already know that quantum theory is non-local. So where I think we need to kind of push is in, in making uh, the idea of a non-local connection between fields, something that people are, are willing to entertain. And I, I have a, a new edition of my um, Cambridge book coming out, the one on the transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics, the reality of possibility. That's actually in press right now. And I, uh, it's, significantly revised and updated. And I, I include some comments about the, the Eastern approach of yin yang is very apt here because what we have in the, in the traditional way of looking at fields is it's all yang. So it's all kind of, you, you, you hit the ball, it goes out and you're done. And it's, the ball has its own autonomous trajectory. But that's, that's not at all what happens in the transactional picture. It's very mutual. And it's a mutual uh, decision by, you know, if I may use anthropomorphic language, uh, it's, it's a mutual kind of process entered into by 
emitters and absorbers where they do know about each other. And it takes both of them to kind of elevate their interaction to this non-unitary actualizing process. So there we, we have a, a yin yang, we have that reception and response is just as important as initiation, creation, and that kind of thing. So we have this, this very balanced process in the transactional, the direct action picture fields that's completely lacking in the usual uh, metaphysics of field propagation. So that's kind of where I would, um, you know, if people are interested in, in pursuing these ideas that, that it's good to keep in mind that, that underlying all the, the Gordian knot, you know, of the measurement problem is this background assumption that everything is unilateral, that, that things are emitted and end of story. And when you do that, you end up kind of applying this unitary evolution to everything that happens. And then you end up with Schrodinger's cat and Wigner's friend and all the the contradictions and inconsistencies that, that we run into. Whereas if you do have this yin-yang relational process from which actualities emerge, then we have a clear account of, of why we get measurement, what measurement is. Of course, we still you, you still can't say, well, you can't tell me why I got this outcome and not the others. But that's once again, a, an issue of um, symmetry breaking, which we have elsewhere in physics. So the, the idea of symmetry breaking where nature kind of deals you many, many possibilities and nature, but then only one is selected. We see that in other areas of physics. So that's not really a reason to say, you know, that, that, that TI's account of measurement isn't complete, which is something I get a lot. So um, any, any other, uh, I don't know. That's about all I had for now. That's um, great. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. Sure. Um, a lot to chew on there. But before we get into dialogue um, about some of the issues you raised, I want to invite uh, Professor Michael Epperson to join us. Um, professor Epperson is a research professor and founding director of the Consortium for Philosophy and the Natural Sciences at California State University in Sacramento. Hey, Michael, I uh, hope the air is, is clearing up for you over there in Sacramento. I know it's been a little rough, but yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's going to be rough for it's, it's <laughs> Thanks a lot, Matt. Yeah, it's going to be rough for everybody uh, down the road. So I don't know, we should we should we should pay attention to this stuff. It actually I mean, when you're living in it, it's becomes obvious a little, little, little bit more uh, uh, concerning, but it's pretty amazing how how these things are uh, uh, speeding up. You know, the, these changes are, are coming a lot, a lot more rapidly than, than anticipated, but um, I don't want to get off on that. Um, well, I just wanted to amplify uh, uh, my uh, Ruth's appreciation of Tim's work. And Tim, I saw you guys last time. Um, I didn't really get it. I think I did say I really liked your book a little bit the first uh, or the last time uh, this group met, but I want to reiterate that. Um, the thing that that uh, that I think is important uh, about the book is that it reminds us that um, you know it's a choice to decide that 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 our understanding of nature at the level of physics or at the level of fundamental physics, quantum physics, has meaning beyond that um, restricted locus. It's a choice for us to to believe that, um, and it's it's really I, I think it's good to explicitly acknowledge that that's what we're doing when we when we attempt to generalize some interesting novel feature of of, of modern physics to generalize it in, in, into into types of experience that might exceed what we would normally try to coordinate uh, via physics. Um, not that we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying it's good to explicitly acknowledge. Yeah, this is what we're doing, and that's why I like Whitehead. His his, his uh, use of the word of the phrase speculative uh, metaphysics. You know, he he's very explicit about the fact that this is speculative, and that's okay. It doesn't mean that it's that that it we should be suspicious of it. It just means that what we're doing is we're 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 engaging in a creative act when we do this. So we have to we have to. I think it's important, especially when you're talking about physics, because physics uses very definitive language. Um, it's very careful and very precise about um, its, its, its formalisms and that's great, but that can sometimes give us the, 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 the misapprehension that, uh, that, that speculative extensions of, of those very precise formalisms are equally certain. 
and there obviously this isn't the case. And luckily, history of science reveals this because uh, we see all the errors that 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 that, that uh, we can easily um, uh, study and trace as they've evolved throughout history. And we can say, well, as careful as science is, it still makes mistakes, and which again is okay, and that's the whole point. But speculative metaphysics, I think we should hold to the same standard. Um, but anyway, so we, we, I'm just saying we, we should probably be, be careful about um, uh, generalizing um, our understandings of quantum mechanics um, uh, when we do make those generalizations. And we all do. I mean, all of us, I'm sure, in, the, in, in this group uh, are aware of this. I'm just trying to say I wish more, uh, I, I wish more, especially more physicists who, um, who, who speak to the popular audience, uh, th that they were a little more careful about, about that. Um, and this is why, as Tim uh, mentioned before, you know, if we do this as physicists, um, we should acknowledge that there are philosophical considerations that, that we should be uh, explicit about when we make these, these, uh, these speculative assertions. Um, so just saying that right off the bat, that's sort of just as a preamble for what I'm going to do now, which is to take some physics and and and, and propose some some generalizations of the of the physics beyond the specific locus of quantum mechanics. Ruth had mentioned, um, hey Ruth, by the way, it's, it's been a hot minute. Um, the, the the emphasis of non-unitary evolution of a state. Um, uh, th this I completely agree with. This is super important. What does it mean? That's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit, just unpack it a little bit more from the standpoint of a Whiteheadian perspective. Um, uh, so the idea would be, you know, f f the, the block universe model that Tim talks about a little bit in, in chapter three as, as being a model that probably is inadequate for our current understandings of the way nature functions. Um, the idea there is that you just have stuff and the stuff is dynamical, it moves. And we can specify the state of a system, which is just basically a snapshot of the stuff. And um, if we understand the forces involved in the, the dynamics, then that means that any state that you specify has information about any future state and any past state, and there's nothing new. And quantum mechanics undermines this significantly. Probably the best way to describe it would be, um, or, or, or to, to uh, explain it would be, you know, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle one of the interesting consequences of it is that um, measurement doesn't just reveal the state of all that stuff. Measurement generates a novel state. So measurement states after measurement are consequent of measurement. They're just not just subsequent of measurement, they're consequent. So the act of measurement changes the state. So now we have novelty and there really was no novelty in the, in the block universe picture or in a surely deterministic framework. There's no novelty. Uh, there's novelty in knowledge, your knowledge of the system, I guess you could say is novel. But then again, if you fold the observer into nature, then I guess the observer is purely deterministic as well, so that everything is fundamentally deterministic. Um, but if you don't do that and you say, well, there's novelty, and, and a state after the measurement is, is, is a different, there, there's a whole new universe of discourse. If I want to apply propositional logic to, um, and to uh, predictions about what subsequent states will be, um, I have to acknowledge that the act of measurement introduces a new universe of discourse. There are new propositions that can be formulated after measurement that you couldn't formulate before. So we can say that the, the state after measurement is, is novel. And in, in the Whiteheadian sense as well, I mean, if we map all this onto um, uh, the, uh, the theory of prehension, you could say, yeah, it's the, it's the subject superject. Well, that's the, the novelty is the superject side of the subject superject. Okay. So what do we just go from the initial state to the final state? What, how does that happen? What, 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 what's the process by which that, uh, that unfolds? And in, in quantum mechanics, you know, the idea of a unitary evolution is just that, well, it, yes, really, it's a novel state, but there's nothing necessarily, uh, uh, depending on the interpretation, there's nothing necessarily um, um, in, present in the, in, the, in the subsequent state after measurement that um, is different than what was there before. You know, there's an equal sign, right? I think I talked about this a little bit the last time we talked. Um, but um, so that's the unitary, uh, uh, the idea of a unitary evolution. Well, a non-unitary evolution is very Whiteheadian idea. Um, and this was, uh, for those of you who like the physics, this would be something like a von Neumann's process one, where, where he basically says, well, no, you have the initial state 
and on its way to a measurement outcome, a final state. Um, there's, a, um, there's a definition of potential states. And that definition of potential states is, is it, it's very complex. It doesn't satisfy, you can't really formulate propositions ab ab about it uh, because there's violations of non-contradiction and excluded middle, but that big mess of potential states becomes uh, refined a little bit, well, a lot, into a, um, a selection of probable outcome states, all of which do satisfy non-contradiction and excluded middle. So they're mutually exclusive and exhaustive um, states that haven't happened yet, but we can now evaluate them according to probabilities. That's the non-unitary move. Uh, and, and it's irreversible. You know, the move from initial state to, to selection of uh, probable outcome states by way of bigger selection of potential outcome states, you, you can't, that's, that's irreversible. And um, uh, th this is very Whiteheadian. I mean, for those of you out there who, who, who like Whitehead, this should sound familiar to you because what you're doing essentially is evaluating um, subjective forms. So it's sort of like the probable outcome states um, you are analogous to Whitehead subjective forms, one of which will become actualized at ter terminal of the measurement. This is kind of nice uh, because, um, again, if we are going to generalize physics to, to something broader the way Whitehead had intended, it's very easy to find analogies to the, of, of this process, just everyday experience. This is what happens when we decide what we're going to eat for dinner. Um, you know, this is what, when you're ordering from a menu, you know, this is kind of the process that happens. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, the, 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 the aspect of this basic framework that, that Tim focuses on in chapter three is the idea that, well, what happens if these, these processes um, um, are, if we really do universalize them and we have to assume that they're going on everywhere and it's local context that determines the subjective forms in Whitehead. Uh, and likewise, in quantum mechanics, it's local measurement uh, apparatus that determines that menu of probable outcome states. Uh, the, the menu of probable outcome states always makes reference to some particular local measurement context. So that's sort of like what Whitehead would call the subjective standpoint at the actual occasion. You know, uh, there's, there's an infinite number of them. They're all over the place. And the question is, well, do they, do, do they correlate in any way? In non-local quantum measurement, like uh, when you're dealing with non-local entanglement, the answer is, yeah, they do in a quantifiable way. You can show how one local context that's so far apart from another local context that, that physics doesn't allow for any kind of causal relationship between the two. What Whitehead would say there's no causal efficacy between the two. Um, so the, the, the two contexts somehow um, are relevant to one another. Um, we can show how that relevance plays out in the way that it changes the probability distribution for the measurement outcomes you, you, you get. That, that would be something like the EPR phenomenon. But what, what, how do we know which contexts are relatable that way and which contexts are not? Because presumably in this big universe, um, there are contexts that really don't go together at all. So um, at measurement outcomes in one part of the universe really should be irrelevant to measurement outcomes in another part of the universe. Presumably that's true. Um, uh, what we're talking about is taking entanglement, which really only deals with contexts that are relatable. Um, uh, and entanglement is not local. But what if you were to generalize entanglement to, to contexts that are not necessarily relatable, at least in any way that you can specify in physics? Can we, can we make that move and say all local contexts matter? Not just some, not just those we can define via entanglement in physics, but do all local contexts matter in some sort of global way? That's a big move, um, difficult to demonstrate in quantum mechanics, which again is very narrow. We, entanglement is very narrowly defined phenomenon, but what happens if we generalize it in the way that Whitehead suggested we, we, we can do? Um, that's a very interesting idea because it means that all local contexts matter in some way to, to each other, that the universe itself is involved in every local contextualization of itself. Um, that's sort of a metaphysical move. Uh, that's a move I like to make. The question is, how do we formalize that? Uh, you can formalize it mathematically. Uh, one way is to, is to use um, a sheath theory the way Elias and I try to do in, in, our, in our framework. There's a lot of ways to do it. 
but it's an interesting avenue to explore because maybe there are there, there eventually we're going to expand the very narrow definition of quantum entanglement in such a way that it allows us to 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 uh, I guess in in via physics demonstrate the relevance of um, of con of, of non-local contextuality globally that we're not able to do right now. So right now we just we're focused on the measured system and the environment, which is everything irrelevant to the particular measurement. History of physics shows that what we used to throw away as environment and we would say it was irrelevant if you study or if, you're, if your interpretation of quantum mechanics is one where the uh, process of decoherence is, is fundamental. Well, that we don't believe that anymore. The environment is actually crucial to, um, to local measurement outcomes. It's not something that's irrelevant. The, the word environment, uh, which used to mean everything we're not interested in. Physi quantum physics, at least one interpretation of it, or many interpretations of it, uh, confute that idea. The environment is, is, is fundamentally relevant locally. So the global is relevant local, locally. That's one way that we, that we are redefining the relation of local to global, and maybe there are others. So I, that's the main point I wanted to make is that we have to be careful when we say, oh, entanglement, what that's doing is showing how we can paste together or glue together to use the sheep theoretic term, um, manifold local contexts that are space-like separated from one another. It's not really that. It's, it's, it's that there's a presumption that there is some kind of way to relate them. Um, that might exceed the way that we do it in physics when we're just dealing with the phenomenon of entanglement. And is there a way to formalize that? Um, that, that's, that I think is the big move that we're, trying to, that we're trying to make here. So it's ultimately about local and global relations in quantum mechanics. And um, uh, anyway, I think that's, just, I, I didn't keep track of my time either. How, do I have, what's happening? That's that's perfect, Michael. Are we good? Uh, okay. We're good. Um, we went a little bit longer <clears throat> because uh, both you and Ruth um, had so much of uh, great importance to share. I wanted to give you a little extra time. Um, okay. Before we open it up, um, Tim, did you want to offer any response to what's been shared thus far? You're, you're muted, Tim. Oh, yes. Okay, here we go. Uh, and uh, so I want to thank... Uh, Ruth and Michael for really excellent uh, summaries of uh, the uh, key elements of their work and how it uh, relates to uh, the, the current discussion and, uh, and also how complementary their descriptions are. Uh, that's one thing I noted as I first read it. And then when I realized they did a joint paper together uh, about two years ago, I was just thrilled, which then, of course, I incorporated into as a reference within the book. Um, so uh, in, in a way, I, uh, let's see, I can some, somewhat think that Ruth's transactional interpretation is somewhat more of, uh, in terms of the emphasis on the unitary, non-unitary, uh, from somewhat the side of the, uh, the uh, order of potentia. Uh, and then the constraints on that order so as to enable the quantum system. And uh, on the other hand, uh, Mike Anelius's framing is uh, getting at the same thing, but somewhat from the side of the order of actualization and the constraints on that for, in terms of the principle of non-contradiction and so forth. Uh, uh, in other words, I, I kind of see them as complementary frameworks. And the extent of that complementarity of their two approaches uh, is implicit, I think, in their joint work, but I don't think it's quite explicit. Uh, anyway, I invite either one of them to comment on how their joint paper in the International Journal of Physics, uh, if, if, uh, if comment on that paper and maybe any follow-up note uh, concerning that joint effort. Thank you. Ruth, you want to? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I um, I I really enjoyed working with. I think it, Stu Kaufman probably gets credit for getting the three of us together on that paper, um, and uh, it was it was fun to write because we have you know the, this shared 
um, clearly this shared understanding, I think, you know, of, of the importance of the, the reality of possibility and how uh, quantum theory is, is clearly pointing to that. I guess what I would um, bring out, and, and it's just kind of something to identify, it's not something I claim to, to have a, you know, a solution for or anything, but um, the, the, the transactional picture is, is again very narrow in that it deals with um, physical systems like charges and atoms, things that can emit and absorb. Um, and I, because of the form of quantum theory, I think of these as possibilities in that clearly their states and their, their description doesn't fit into space time. So I, I take them as kind of living in this, what I call a quantum substratum. So, but that's a very quantitatively well-defined domain. So on the other hand, I appreciate what Mike just pointed out about if we're gonna to try to extend this and generalize it uh, to more of a macro level or even to level of human choices that it, it we're dealing with a, we're going beyond that in a sense where, so I have to, I wanna acknowledge that that's a generalization that goes beyond the narrow physical theoretical description. Um, and I think Stu's focus is more on the more general notion of possibility, which includes, you know, the idea that, hey, we could meet for coffee at some place tomorrow. And, uh, and if we decide not to, then the world has changed. The actual world ends up changing and, and he's pointing that out. So, so that's very interesting. And we, and we also have to take those possibilities seriously, but I kind of think of that as a different ontological category. So mm -hmm. I, I just kind of to tag those two and say, I, I, I call the quantum systems that we could describe by quantum theory, call them physical possibilities. And then the other notion of possibility that's more general, more broad, more dealing with human choices could ultimately boil down to be uh, to being um, reducible to those objects, but I don't know that. I don't know that. So I just kind of think of those as a more general form of possibility. So that's kind of what came to mind and just kind of delineating these two different categories for now. Yeah. Mike, any thoughts further? Yeah, um, and actually I was just looking at the comments and from uh, Anderson asked a, a good question that actually connects with what Ruth was just saying too. Um, so the, the question is, okay, well, how, if we're gonna talk about relations, global, local relations that exceed the way we define entanglement in quantum mechanics, um, what would those look like? How, how what, what's the nature of these things? Uh, it, it, presumably, the desideratum is that whatever we say about them, it should be compatible with what we know to be true quantum mechanically. And um, I would say um, that the easiest way to answer the question would be to say that, um, presuming that, that all global, all local contexts that are non-local to each other, say space-like separated, are relatable in some way. What, what that really means is we're saying we can make some sort of logical proposition um, about something out there based on our information about what's going on here. Likewise, whatever I wanna say about what the possibilities are here could be affected conceivably by things that are going on out there, even if they're space-like separated. And um, uh, one way of, of visualizing this, I suppose, uh, that, that, that's at least intuitive for me would be to say, okay, let, let, what do we mean by global? It's the whole state, right? So imagine a global system represented by something like a Mobius strip, which is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, just take a ribbon and twist it once and then glue the ends together. It's got a very interesting shape. Uh, uh, and and it, if you were to say, okay, well, how am I to understand this global shape? The local context would be, say, if you took little fibers that were perpendicular to the, to the, to the, uh, the length of the strip, so fibers going crosswise, just like if the strip were made of fabric, it would be made of these fibers, and each little thread represented a local context of that overall state. Well, what you could do is look at all those local threads together, relate them each other, to each other algebraically. Um, and you could say, well, I can kind of glue together, piece together a global picture by looking at each of these threads together. 
But actually what happens is if you do that, you end up with just a cylinder because there's no way to capture that twist. If you look at the global state in terms of some sort of concatenation of all these local threads. So you do get some information about the global picture by doing it this way. Um, so that would mean that using a bunch of quantum measurements, you could sort of induce a, some sort of picture of the global state, but you could not reduce the global state to that picture. You're gonna capture some features of the global state, but you're not gonna be able to ever capture the complete picture of the global state analytically by looking at all these local contexts together. So you can induce a picture of the global, but you can't analytically reduce the global to a bunch of local uh, measurements. Um, that, that's certainly true of quantum mechanics. And if you extend it beyond that to some sort of metaphysical generalization, it just means that we presume there's a relevance, but we're not able to formalize it at least via something like analysis. There's always gonna be something beyond our formalization that's true. And by the way, if you believe that in, in the Whiteheadian picture that this is an event ontology, that, that the universe unfolds, there's novelty with each relation, there's a new universe, you're never gonna be able to capture the global picture anyway with any particular um, local measurement because as soon as you've made the local measurement, the global picture has changed and it's going to exceed whatever it was that your or whatever uh, state specification you were trying to formulate with that measurement. By the time the measurement's done, the global state has changed Anyway, so however you look at it, the global is always going to exceed the local, but that doesn't mean that you cannot um, paint a picture uh, of the global that, that could be accurate, if not comprehensive, I guess would be the idea. Yep. That's, that's good, Mike. I might note uh, for some viewers, uh, they may not necessarily know what space-time separated or, 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 uh, uh, or, or just space, Anyway, space-time uh, separated really means, and that is that speed of light is not adequate to cause a connection for space-time space, time separated regions. And, um, and, that, and, and another part of your comment about the, and what Ruth mentioned about uh, weaving these elements together, uh, that reminds me about a passage in her book, uh, Understanding Our Unseen Reality, that I especially enjoyed on page 168. If you get this book, which I recommend, by the way, uh, there it is. Uh, and, and she got this wonderful metaphor about the fabric of space time uh, with the metaphor of, um, of, 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 of weaving a, um, a, 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 a like, like in weaving a cloth or whatever. Uh, so, and, and I, find, I found this metaphor very useful in thinking about these, uh, the, the, the uh, processes of weaving together the, uh, the, the order of the uh, actual and the possible in the basis of quantum process uh, that, that you, at the ground, you have, so to speak, a pre-space that space-time in the Einsteinian sense isn't, is, 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 so to speak, generated as you as you go along here uh, from a, an immediate present to another immediate present, you know, bootstrapping one after the other, they're constantly being woven one after the other. And that space time uh, in the Einsteinian sense is literally being created uh, from one present to another present to another present uh, out of the underlying pre-space. And that in the pre-space, you have this, this non-Boolean interconnectedness uh, and the exchange of the transactional interpretation that uh, Ruth talks about, and, and you also have this global, the non-Boolean global that Mike talks about, and but then in the successive exchange, the successive phases of the actualizations from one present to another, then that's the uh, that sequence of actualizations is that uh, narrowing down and completion, that actualization uh, of uh, Mike's uh, frame framing, uh, that the the symmetry breaking actualizations. Uh, across the board, uh, and that this fundamental process is like a series relevant relative strategy that philosopher James Bradley talked about. Uh, that uh, everything, so to speak, is caught up with respect to this weaving of from one to the next, and so to speak, there's nothing like a particular dualism of Descartes of a subject object or mind, body, or other kind of dualism that is a projected fixed framing that 
that everything, so to speak, of that type uh, in, uh, is, so to speak, emergent from this uh, process, which in turn is grounded in a these pre-space uh, fundamental process of which we're just, uh, so to speak, one darn thing after the other, one metaphysical present after the other. And now, in a way, a, the notion of a metaphysical present makes sense in a way that didn't in classical metaphysics. Uh, it, it, any, any comment about that? That now we can re begin anew to think about the meaningfulness of just that it like it's like a presentism, you know, one metaphysical present after the other, uh, but it's it, it's grounded in the pre space, and so you have these global correlations in the pre space uh, that, but then in the successive actualizations, there, and then one feeds right into the other, and that the information of the former is then embedded into the, the next, and then bootstrapped along, and so our world uh, is so to speak. It's somewhat like a presentism that that the future is not actualized. It's open. It's it, it's a order of potential, uh, and the past is incorporated into the present. It's like that bootstrapping. That's yeah, if I could. Uh, yes, I I love what you just said, and I and I think that uh, this kind of fills in a big gap in the way physics has has kind of disparaged the present, and we have the famous. Um, term from a gentleman whose name I can't remember now, the specious present. Okay, well, it's no longer specious. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think of basically what I call the quantum substratum as that is the present. If you want to think of a kind of a global present, it's, it's, it's an eternal kind of realm because it doesn't have, you could say it has an internal temporality, perhaps in this, in the cycles of periodicities of atoms and, and fermions and so on, electron type objects. But um, I think of it as, uh, you know, I guess we need to disengage the notion of change from the notion of time in a metrical sense. So what I would propose is that we, we have the present, but it changes. So, you know, you can think of it as a, as a different present each time, or you can think of the present as a domain that is subject to change, but it's just not actualized change. So that um, you know, it's it's a domain that is is being affected by the actualizations, but it's it is changing. It, it's capable of change, dynamical change, but not not change that can be indexed by a metrical time coordinate in the usual way. So I, I like to think of it as kind of a, a snake shedding its skin so that, you know, you have the living snake is just hanging out, doing stuff, you know, and then the skin is coming off. And clearly that's a, a concrete record of what the snake has been through, if you will, you know, deal with this metaphor for a bit. But, but the living moment is is eternal in a sense and i think you know and that I, I think that you can identify that with the quantum substratum in a very accurate way that it it's dynamical um but it it it's the precursor to space-time events and in that sense it's it's eternal so um yeah you know that that's what i would say about that very good I, I'm reminded of um, one of uh, Jorge Luis Borges's um, poems where he says that everything happens for the first time, but in a way that is eternal. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he's I think he's capturing that. So if uh, you are already, I'll open it up for questions from the other participants. Um, I ask that uh, you try to keep your comment or question as concise as you can so that we can hear from as many of you as possible. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, uh, Randy Oxier's question, which is um, speaking of speculative philosophy and, and Whitehead scheme, it's a question about the ontology of possibilities. Um, Randy, do you want to unmute and frame your question for us? Um, sure. Um... Uh, actually, something Ruth said a little bit later kind of gets at the heart of it. She made the distinction between uh, what she was calling physical possibilities 
which is what I take Tim's category of potentia really to be about. And then there's some other kind of possibility, and of course this is the kind of interest to me, but it interests me not just uh, uh, in the psychological or the human sense. Um, uh, I think Whitehead gives an ontological standing to the kind of possibility that Ruth is saying. Uh, I mean, eternal objects are uncreated for Whitehead. And so he has no theory of emergence, um, uh, but uh, uh, certainly not in the way that that term is used in contemporary philosophy in any case. Um, and so instead, he has this alternative of uh, a category that he ultimately calls creativity. And that comes pretty close to what Ruth was talking about with the eternal now. Uh, the, the, I mean, that's the, my understanding of Whitehead's uh, idea of, of creativity is that uh, as the category of the ultimate really is pretty close to what Ruth was saying right at the end of her uh, comments and your boy, your boy has <laughs> as well. Um, there is something about um, the way that the eternal and the temporal interact uh, that, uh, uh, that isn't really what we're talking about when we're doing physics. <laughs> and so uh, uh, there's uh, and so the the theory of potentiae, uh, I think, uh, uh, as Tim has framed it, is 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 really good as far as it goes. But there is this other thing. There is this this sense of possibility that's uncreated for Whitehead that I think actually has some implications for how we do how we think about physical science as well as human experience and other things. Um, and just one other point, and I'll shut up. Uh, the uh, uh, the connection. Of the, I mean, Anderson has a really great question here about non-Boolean. <laughs> I hope you guys can get to uh, to this uh, the, the non-Boolean actualization versus the non-Boolean possibilities, uh, because that's sort of the that's the second worry that I really have, uh, which is there's more than one way to skin a Boolean, um, and and uh, uh, and and I think that uh, the non-Boolean actual could be not a bad basis for the digitization of reality, but the, uh, the non-Boolean possible. Now that's a lot more interesting to me. And so it connects to what I was saying earlier. The non-Boolean possible would include the uncreated internal, e eternal objects of Whitehead. So that, that was just, that's my observation. I'd be curious what people say about it. Um, well, you know, I, um... Again, this goes back to, uh, in, you know, I can't really give you a good answer, obviously, but going back to this distinction, you know, between phys the physical possibilities, they, I do take them as, and I think in a rigorous way, you can say that these quantum objects really are in an eternal now. And, and that's why you get these EPR correlations. So I, I really think that is quantitatively uh, consistent way to describe these things. So I obviously I don't want to go into like, well, do atoms kind of have a subjective experience? I have no idea. You know, I don't want to bring those kinds of notions in. But in in a very, um, you know, quantitative way, you can say there's no metrical time. There's no metrical time that applies to these entangled states, you know, pre measurement, right? Um, but the, the distinction we want to make here, I think, is, is captured by, I think it was Quine who was not, not a fan of reifying possibility. And he would, you know, he talked about the slum of possibles. And, you know, an example of which was that fat, that fat man in the doorway, the bald fat man in the door. Do I want to, you know, I can, I can imagine a fat man, bald fat man in the doorway. Do I want to really say that just because I'm imagining this, it's, it exists somewhere? And so he, you know, this is the distinction I would make that I can think of pretty much any crazy thing I want, you know, and, and it doesn't mean it would be describable by quantum theory. Nevertheless, because I can think of this, I could draw a painting of a fat man in a doorway, and then it would be actual, it would be out there in the world, right? So, so clearly these things are consequential. So it, it's kind of fun to think about. I still, I still don't know, um, you know ex exactly how we would characterize that, but there's, we can acknowledge there's a category difference between 
objects that are obviously and traditionally described by quantum theory, like entangled states we can create in the lab and see that there are these non-local correlations. And then the fat men in the doorway, which I don't, I didn't, can't come up with a good quantum mechanical description of or test his existence in the lab, but I can certainly paint a picture of my idea and, and I can certainly actualize it. So it, it's an interesting question about, you know, what is, Idea, I do think ideas are real in some sense, but clearly we, we have to kind of note the, the different category between these, what I call physical possibilities and the, the conceptual ideas that, that we can work with. That, that's somewhat like the, uh, say the realm of, uh, so to speak, you can imagine possibilities that couldn't be consistent with in, coherent and consistent in, in terms of the a, a present actual, uh, so there's some subset that is subject to being, uh, th that could be swept up, up into the probability distributions that Mike spoke of. Uh, so, so to speak, there's the broader radical set of uh, possibilities that are ra radically imaginistic uh, that uh, of which they, they couldn't be uh, in any way conceivably actual. So there's some, yeah, some kind of distinctions there. I'm not quite sure how to handle that myself. Uh, let me note, uh, by the way, that uh, my framework is not tied to a uh, Whiteheadian, you know, I'm influenced by Whitehead, but it's not tied to a Whiteheadian framework as such, uh, including uh, like his theory of eternal objects, which in a way he hypothesized a sort of set of pre-given uh, uh, forms, uh, somewhat, uh, you know, inspired by Plato. And uh, so I, I think that uh, the realms of the possibility uh, are, are broader than that. They're not, uh, they're not necessarily uh, pre-given that as you're marching along here, that then the constraints on the radical realm of the potential keep shifting. Uh, and there's no stable, so to speak, you know, set of what those uh, uh, possibilities are in uh, it, 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 that, that's what I imagine. And that the physical laws that we use, and I'll bring get into this in chapter four, uh, that I think of physical laws not as God-given uh, fixed kinds of things like Newton's equation and so forth, but that inspired by looking at the principle of least action and minimization principles from which we can derive various relations in physics, physical relations, which we uh, sort of is the uh, improper acronym called law uh, that constraints on possibility uh, that the, the fact of the principle of least action and, and its and its power to me implies that one can think of physical law as constraints on possibility uh, and and that's that's what I argue in chapter four uh, and that it, that kind of connects into this that if you think in terms of constraints and possibility in a very broad sense and, and initially thinking of possibilities without effectively without limit, then you got these multiple levels of coherence, consistency, and so forth. Uh, and that it's a project to yet be done philosophically and scientifically about, uh, about that whole set of which on the physics side are uh, constraints getting down to the uh, issue of particular physical laws arising from those constraints. Uh, Anyway, I think it's there's so much more work needs to be done on that. Okay. Yeah, this is a this is a rich um, issue that that Randy is raising, and you know I've got my copy of Whitehead out, but I think we'll take that maybe offline so we can stay focused on you know uh, your contributions, uh, Tim, to this understanding of possibility and. Um, <clears throat> not bring in the Whiteheadian God and, and all the various features of his speculative scheme. Um, as interesting as that may be. So let's see if we can continue. Um, Lynn, are you still with us? You have a, a question about simultaneous independent measurements made by different observers, which, you know, simultaneity gets us into the space-time metric perhaps. And how that might translate into the quantum domain, it might be interesting. So do you want to frame your question for us? So that's actually Lou's question. I'll let him frame it. Well, I, uh, listening to not being a quantum physicist at all, uh, it seemed to me like it simultaneous measurements 
would be precluded. Uh, otherwise, you would potentially run into a considerable potential for contradiction. Because uh, if the measurement, in fact, affects the observed entity, then uh, uh, you can't observe it and then undo the previous measurement because it's already or whatever or the, so I'm, I'm so I, there is there must be a, a constraint on the nature of measurements um i guess i would just quickly say that yes there definitely is sorry i was just replying to someone on the chat uh but yeah there definitely is it in in the in the transactional picture that that's very quantitatively uh addressed and um and any any so-called measurement process would in, would involve a kind of interaction it is going to be constrained by by a metrical constraint that there they would have to be um, at least a, a light-like interval between the emission of, of, a, of a photon particle of light and its absorption. And that's, that actually is manifested locally. So, so a measurement process in the transactional picture ends up creating a local causal, if you will, structure. And that it's, it's a, but it's, it's a self-contained uh, extended process so that you can come along and go oh wait i'm going to do something at the same time it's it's a it's an integral whole that 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 takes place as that whole or not at all so it's an invariant uh, interval of space time that that has to be occurring and it also satisfies conservation laws so the the, the governing you know constraints on that process are such that it's not going to allow um, instantaneous or, or space-like measurements to occur. Could I have a follow-up remark uh, in, a, in a similar way, really, when the, the, the entangled particles are created and separated, like between two different, uh, uh, well, for instance, counters or whatever, <clears throat> if one, after the particle has been sent out, can it be observed twice on the way? Um, well, you've, if you've got two entangled particles, um, basically they are going to be locally, um, I mean, it depends actually whether you're talking about something like photons that are entangled or particles that have rest mass like electrons, but we, we probably don't need to get into that for, for our current purposes, but you, you couldn't, I mean, there, the whole process is such that, again, it's a, it's an, a whole system. So it's quantum state uh, is, is not separable for the individual particles. So whatever happens to one of the particles is, is going to affect the transactional opportunities for its partner, for its entangled partner and vice versa. So, so it's, a global, it's a global constraint. And even though they undergo their own separate local interactions, the constraint is a global one. So it's kind of what Mike was talking about. It's a, it's a global, you could see it as a topological connection in that sense that the, even though these are the individual detections of the two particles are local operations, there's a global connection between them that that di dictates what's going to happen or what the probabilities are for those local detections. And since they're globally connected in that way, non-locally connected in that way, it's just in, you know, for our from our perspective, instantaneous. And whatever happens with that local particle number one is going to dictate the transactional opportunities for our local particle two. And that's it. Once you've got your transactional opportunities, you've got a, a, a set of contextual probabilities and, a, and you're going to get an outcome. So that's all you can get it, really for each of those is, is one outcome. Thank you. Oh, um, can I just jump? Yeah, well, can Mike, I just jump uh, in? Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, let me segue to you, Mike. I, uh, you, your discussion talks about in, in your work, the, uh, the Boolean uh, frames, the distinct Boolean frames and associated Boolean subalgebra, and how you uh, adjudicate those within a overall non-local, -lo non uh, uh, global uh, frame. 
So please go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I love the question. And I, I agree, obviously, I agree with completely with what Ruth said. Um, but you mentioned coincidence counter in your question. And I just want to focus on that for a second, because this is an example of kind of, kind of what I was referring to at the beginning of uh, my remarks about we got to be careful about extending, you know, very precise things like in the parameters of an EPR experiment to some broader statement. But, I, but in this case, it works pretty well by analogy, local and global. So local uh, would be uh, in this framework, um, the individual detectors. However they're configured, those are the local context for those uh, detectors. Let's say they're 30 meters apart in a typical EPR experiment in a lab. So locally, you're right. There's a kind of simultane simultaneity, at least from the perspective, from the local perspectives of the different detectors. In other words, it doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter from the point of view of each detector, which detection occurs first, right? Because they're separated, they're far enough apart that there is no time for any kind of uh, energetic uh, signal to move from one to the other to affect them. However, each of those detectors is connected to a coincidence counter, like, like you had said. So, so it means regardless of the fact that from the local perspectives, there's a kind of simultaneity going on. In other words, there's an irrelevance. This context could care less what that context is doing or measuring because they're too far apart to matter. But each of those local contexts is plugged into a coincidence counter. So from our point of view, we're, we have kind of a God's eye point of view uh, as the experimenter because we have access to the coincidence counter. We can see which detector clicks first and therefore, from our point of view, uh, the global point of view in this experiment, we can see how an outcome at detector A changes the probability distribution for what might occur at detector B. So we can, we can see in advance the, 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 these relations that from the local perspectives are, are irrelevant. Um, but from, from our global perspective, we can see. Now, as far as Tim's question about, well, what a Boolean algebra have to do with this, without getting too technical, it's just a way of saying every local measurement context can be represented as a Boolean algebra of observables, which is basically, you're basically saying, here are the things I'm going to measure. Um, I'm going to um, form propositions about the different measurement outcomes based on this context. And is there a way that I can take this particular algebra and relate it to a different algebra of observables? Um, it's sort of like if you have an algebra textbook that's full of word problems, you might have uh, a word problem that has to do with, uh, you know, uh, uh, gas mileage. You know, you've got a car that has to travel a certain distance and there's a certain amount of fuel and whatever, and there's an algebra for that problem. Maybe later in the book, there's a problem that has to do with a car, gas mileage, overlapping observables but maybe that problem also involves uh, money, the cost of gas. How much will it cost for you to make this trip? Well, the first problem doesn't involve the, 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 the money uh, observable. The other one does. That doesn't mean that you can't overlap those two algebras. You can, there is an overlap uh, that, that sort of connects with this idea of an, an induction, an induction of a global picture that includes both of those word problems. It's not <laughs> exhaustive, but it, but it at least gives you some uh, way of relating one word problem to the other. That's kind of like what happens in an EPR experiment. You've got one detector that's configured a certain way with its own algebra of observables, and then another one as well. And even though they might be sl slightly different, you can still see how the algebra changes for the second detection event based on the outcome of the first detection event. And, um, so the, the, the local is relevant to the global, but likewise, what is globally separate from something that's local, say space-like separated, can still restrict the possibilities for a measurement outcome locally. So in our book, we call it uh, the extension of the local to the global and the restriction of the local by the global. And you can formalize both of those um, and, um, and experimentally they're, they're validated by um, things like EPR types of entanglement um, scenarios. Well, there's more to ask there, but I, I should demand the question. Because it's, yeah, I was thinking of two X-ray machines simultaneously okay. looking at Schrodinger's cat in the box, and they then the picture that they take will tell the cat dead or not. So you can translate okay. that into to it. So, is there only one outcome? 
for the, same, the two that are the same. So that means that the cat was already dead anyway. So. I would say yes, because in that example, it, it, in, in that example, the detection events aren't the only things involved with deciding the probabilities of whether the cat is alive or dead. There are all kinds of interactions between the cat and everything else in that box, not just the two x-ray detectors. So um, that's probably not, the, for me, heuristically, not the best example. Whereas an EPR type of measurement, that works pretty well because the only things that are operative are the particles being measured and the detection events for each particle. There's really nothing else that can, that, that can influence the outcome. So it's not um, individual particles, it's, um, it's um, collections of particles. If I could just interject, actually, in, in the transactional picture, you, in a very quantitative way, it, you can see how you would never actually end up with the Schrodinger's cat issue. And right. that, that, you know, Schrodinger, Schrodinger came up with his cat experiment as a way of basically criticizing unitary only quantum theory uh, and it showing that it leads to absurdities and and because people most researchers really want to think of quantum theory as really being unitary only meaning that they really think it has no real non-unitarity in it physically they they are stuck with schrodinger's cat and now you have a whole bunch of people purporting to do schrodinger's cat and wigner's friend experiments and and coming up with uh, a lot of very inconsistent ontologies which they claim apply to the world and and you you know in in the transactional picture you would get a very clear account of why no we're not going to end up with a cat in a superposition so there's a very clear account for why that that wouldn't happen. But certainly we do have, we still do have global, uh, we can create those entangled states that, that do have those non-local implications. So we wanna distinguish between the idea of, of a single object that ent enters into a macroscopic superposition that we know is, is absurd. And then the different situation of having entangled particles, which we know it does happen in, in nature. So it's just two yeah, different a, things. Yeah. That's an example. What Ruth has brought out is an example of the power of these possibilist interpretations, both Ruth and Michael's and related. Uh, by the way, Matt, I've seen that in the chat, uh, Mikhail Epstein has brought up a very interesting question about broadening this in terms of entanglement, uh, it, it, going beyond physics, uh, notions of metaphors, poetry, et cetera. Uh, I'd be interested in. Uh, Respond just, just maybe uh, Professor Epstein to articulate his question for us. Uh, thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, indeed, when uh, I um, hear all this conversation about entanglement as uh, relatively uh, new in physics, the principle of non locality and so on, I immediately uh, uh, recall what uh, has been discussed for centuries in poetics, in aesthetics. Uh, uh, but uh, in relation not to quanta, but to qualia, yes. So we can uh, talk about, uh, so to say, qualt uh, mechanics, uh, uh, mechanics of qualia. And this is what poetry is about. This is what uh, imagination, uh, artistic imagination is about. We take uh, uh, the uh, quality of one object uh, and in a non-local way, ascribe it uh, to another object. Like in the uh, most evident metaphors, uh, starry eyes, for example. That means eyes that shine, shine like stars. Yes, uh, that means the quality of uh, stars are ascribed to eyes. Uh, or uh, the opposite metaphor: uh, the stars were looking uh, at her uh, uh, as uh, intimately as uh, eyes. And this is such a metaphor in Russian poetry, for example. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one of the most uh, direct ways to uh, connect uh, these two uh, cultures, the, cultures uh, the culture of uh, uh, physics, of sciences, and the culture of uh, um, uh, the humanities uh, through the concept of non-locality and uh, uh, entanglement, uh, uh, and uh, introducing the common principles uh, to uh, the world of uh, quanta and qualia, uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, units uh, of uh, reality. And uh, also, uh, I would like to emphasize that we have the most, uh, much more direct access 
to the world of uh, quality, of course, than to the, uh, to the world of uh, quanta, which we have to observe through uh, a lot of machinery, through uh, uh, physical instruments and so on. Whereas this uh, entanglement is permanently present within our own consciousness. Uh, in this uh, uh, acts that could be called uh, uh, creative acts uh, of imagination, uh, association, so by association, and I would like to remind that Art of Kursler uh, derived the entire specificity of creative act from dissociation. That means what we call today uh, non-locality, when one uh, uh, object uh, is uh, receives uh, uh, the definition from the qualities of another object. This is how, uh, uh, for example, the printing press was uh, invented according to uh, Kursler analysis uh, in his act of creation, the book that I recommend to everybody. Uh, because it deals with foundational principles of uh, imagination uh, and uh, bridges uh, the humanities and physics. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Let's entangle physics and non-physics, uh, so to say. Yeah. yeah thank you, Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Um... In terms of, say, so to speak, the notion of qualia and going beyond just the mere way of numbers. Uh, if you limit ourselves to, I talked last time, last session about the uh, three fundamental ways, the way of uh, context independence, which is science, the way of context focus and emphasis, the, which is the way of arts and humanities, and the way of ultimate context. Uh, mm -hmm. As uh, If you limit yourself only to the way of numbers and the manipulation of numbers and, and uh, parameters associated with actualizations and outputs to the scientific domain and those correlations only in some space time, then, and also the constraints of highly, highly constrained robots, you, you'll never have qualia. You can't, it's just impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that you want, maybe you could have an impossibility theorem based upon that notion. Uh, those are Boolean systems, but you've got to break out of that and so to speak, have the mm -hmm. possibility of going beyond context independence to recognizing and emphasizing context dependence and these interrelations that then get caught up with the interplay of the order of the actual and the order of the possible uh, that then enables uh, the qualia. Mikhail, can I just jump in really fast? I love your, your, your observation. I think it's amazing. Um, uh, it, it works really well for me of, on a variety of levels, but um, it just, it made me think of the idea that uh, something like an anal a a analogy, the a relationship of analogy um, in, in something like poetry, um, it's almost like an analogy is a non-reductive contextual relation. Um, it's, it, for it to have meaning, it can't just be a complete free-for-all. It's, it's not as though there's no context because it's a contextual relation, but it's non-reductive. So there's a, there's a structure to something like analogy um, but it's, it's an open structure. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a non-reductive kind of structure, but uh, both sides of the analogy are, um, are enhanced from the relation. And, and, and the idea of uh, an analogy, the relata of an analogy are, like I said, they're enhanced by the act of relation. And for me, that's what education, I mean, this is what happens uh, in, 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 in the act of education. It's it's what happens in the act of constructing a language. It seems to me. Um, so that for me, I see some some really interesting uh, parallel. I would think of them as exemplifications, uh, novel exemplifications um, of of very restricted uh, uh, um, uh, phenomena that we can formalize in physics. I, I find them. I find these to be kinds of interesting metaphysical exemplifications of that of those structures that we study in physics. Not that yes. we could ever again reduce the the broader structures to the more narrow physical exemplifications, but we can learn uh, a, a, about how those two types of those two realms of experience of nature are connectable in some meaningful way. That's yes. to me really interesting. Yes, thank you. And uh, I just would like to um, emphasize that uh, metaphor and uh, analogy. It's very fuzzy <laughs> relationship between them. We never know when. Uh, metaphors, uh, poetic metaphor, uh, becomes an uh, analogy in uh, the strict uh, sense. And uh, much of what is going today in uh, sciences, in 
I would say, uh, scientific imagination is built on metaphors, which turned out to be uh, analogies. For example, the idea of the earth as an organism. Is it metaphor? Is it analogy? But it moves ecological movement, you see? Uh, and uh, there is so many, uh, uh, this uh, quasi uh, metaphors, so quasi analogies, which actually <laughs> Uh, fit into this uh, um, area of uh, uh, fuzziness between uh, science and uh, non-science. Uh, and uh, um, there are uh, a lot of examples. For example, universe as a computer, which is uh, what Lloyd's book is about, yes, uh, about uh, informational universe. Again, is it a uh, metaphor or is it analogy? And uh, everywhere today we find uh, merging of these two uh, principles of, uh, think of thinking or uh, Foucault with his archaeology of knowledge. How it is possible? Archaeology deals with material remnants of ancient civilizations, but Michel Foucault uh, founded this new field, archaeology of knowledge. It was metaphor, it became instrument of uh, <laughs> scientific thinking. So that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, thanks for that bridge, uh, Michael. So um, Jude, Jude Jones has been um, sharing a bunch of interesting comments and questions. I'm not sure which one to choose, but I'd love to invite Jude to, to come on board and share what's top of mind uh, at this moment. Oh, gosh. Um, I guess the, the more recent stuff is just, you know, top of mind just because it's local, shall we say? Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, this talking about the, the entanglement and, and a certain active unity of between the quantitative and the qualitative and, and the importance of reintroducing discussion of the qualitative to dethrone the purely quantitative way we have of conceptualizing things, even in physics. I, is endlessly fascinating to me. And, and I confess that, you know, it's always been a fantasy of mine to see if there's a way of hunting down a conceptuality that doesn't distinguish quality and quantity from the outset. You know, I, I, I'm suspicious that that's an inherited habit of, of you know, Western conceptualization, uh, and not just Western, but, you know, we're getting a lot of our terminology there today. Um, and I just want there to be uh, a way of thinking of things. And I, I confess it may just be fantasy. It may be my inveterate habit of trying to explode distinctions, but I, I, it seems almost necessary in my mind for in ways that I can't completely articulate that they be aspects of a single thing that don't need to express themselves in a kind of dual aspect way that we have a tendency to speak of the mass. So is there a way of conceiving of quality and quantity without using them as a duality of, of terms? I know no, no one's trying to buy into a dualism of any sort, but is there a way of having a single term for the work that both of those do and therefore maybe thinking of them in a, in a very, very fresh way beyond what we've managed so far? I really, I, I love your observation and I guess I would, um, I would sort of just observe that physics already does this. I mean, they already use a mixture of quantitative and qualitative concepts in all their theories. Um, and I, I like what you're saying because it points to the mythology, if you will, of treating the, the qualitative aspects as kind of like, uh, those are just kind of like, you, you know, that's the way it is, uh, you know, rather than acknowledge, I mean, terms like matter, right. mass, energy, these are all primitive notions. They're qualitative primitive notions that are key features of our theory. So, and I, and I don't want to jettison them. I, I mean, I think they're important. They're, they're, they're part of the process of generating some kind of account that then has, has, we're checking it empirically. We're going, okay, it's not just any old arbitrary theory. I mean, Newton's laws work, right? So in my view, they're, they're onto something about reality. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to be, you know, just instrumentalist and say, like some people are, and just say, well, it's a recipe for calculating my experiences. No, I think it's really telling us something about reality. But, but at the same time, these are qualitative notions that are fundamental in even generating the theory. So uh, it would be nice if, um, you know, there, there would be some way of acknowledging that theory discovery, even if we want to call it discovery, some people say theory construction because they want to be constructivist about knowledge. No, I think to a great extent, we're discovering structures of the world, but nevertheless, we're working with qualitative, fundamentally qualitative notions. And it would be good to have some overt acknowledgement of that, even though I'm not sure, you know, how, if, if, there, if there's a term that can kind of squash them together, they, they seem as if they're distinct categories but it's very important to note how strongly we're dependent on the qualitative concepts. That's a good point, yeah. Thank you. If one way in my, uh, the Logoi framework that uh, connects these elements together is the notion that, uh, that the triad of input, output, context is radically pervasive. Uh, at all levels, from the, the most elemental scientific and quantum physics to the most inclusive. Uh, so that, in, in, in that the context has elements that uh, involve both the quantity and the quality uh, in, 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 inevitably. So I think that's at least one way in which this th these get connected together. Uh, and of course, in our approximations, in the approximations that we use to enable this focus on the way of numbers of science, then we set those things aside. But then they come back to haunt us when we're trying to apply sufficient constraints and approximations so as to radically isolate that particular particle we're trying to measure in our, uh, in, in our, in our experiment. Uh, and on the other extreme, uh, the way in which uh, qualia so dominate that we're so immersed in our poetry, we can't get a grounding in the real world uh, and everything in between. So I think the, the thinking of the triad, the so to speak semiosis of the world, the input output context triadic as being radically pervasive is one way to think about this. So we only have five minutes left. Um, uh, another person who's been very active in the comments is Anderson Weeks. And I wonder, um, Anderson, if you want to join us to share some thoughts. Sure, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, so I, I think you might have officially buried this topic a while back, but I just wanted if I could resurrect it and just clarify. Um, so I, if, if, I, if I understand correctly, Ruth and Michael are taking very different positions on a question that's very interested, interesting to me. Um, as long as I've been alive, uh, the sexy proposition has been that quantum physics tells us all something that is unheard of and you know, barely can, well, changes our whole view of the world and the philosophers have to, to listen. But there's two ways that we've been, that's been proposed. One is there's this unique thing, completely unique to particle physics, that no one can understand unless they are a particle physicist. And it tells us that we have to reimagine what's going on in the world. But the other way of speculatively, speculatively generalizing that discovery is that what we discover there actually has perfect analogies at all levels of experience. And so if we look with enlightened eyes, we'll see that the same kind of problems and peculiarities we find in, in quantum phenomena actually have real and meaningful analogs, as Tim would say, at all levels of reality and all levels of experience. And am I correct uh, in understanding, Ruth, that you are you go with the former position rather than the latter? You think that maybe we are experimenting with analogies that are uh, amphibolies or uh, vague, vague analogies that don't really have um, ontological significance? Or have I overinterpreted what you were saying? Um, gee, I'm not. I I guess I, what I would say. I just kind of put something in a chat. Um, the the transactional interpretation itself uh, takes absolutely no position on you know any kind of broader applicability of of relational or quantum um, the kinds of. Uh, revolutionary phenomena that we're getting with quantum quantum theory itself now that i want to take you know 
take off my TI hat and put on my, you know, ordinary human hat. And I guess with the different hat, I, I'm happy to entertain the idea that, that there are um, more uh, quantum-like relational aspects to reality than have been traditionally acknowledged. I, I think that's important, you know, and, and I guess the, um, you know, my reference to the whole yin yang thing, I think that's important in, mm -hmm. in social relationships. And it, I, it, it could well be that, that the, the Eastern, you know, sages were onto something that really this is how nature works at all levels. So that, that's my speculative hat. So I don't, I don't rule it out, but I do make a distinction because I, I do think I, t I think Mike made a good point at the beginning of this and saying that that a lot of physicists talk about quantum theory and then they immediately just kind of indiscriminately start talking about a domain that 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 is is not the domain of quantum theory, at least that you could deal with in the lab. And well, how did they know? I mean, it's fun to speculate. But again, I don't you know, my interpretation absolutely doesn't do that. But as an ordinary human, I'm I'm happy to. I, I think that could be legitimate. It's it's certainly possible. It's just not, you know. I ha I want to make that distinction that I'm being speculative when I do that. Okay, so just one quick follow up. I I think I've had some conversations with Tim about this. I think Tim, correct me if I'm wrong. You actually think that there's a phenomenological argument for the existence of potentia, right? That we can find them in our experience. And that, and you, you invoke that evidence to decide among possible interpretations of quantum physics. You say, we can't find other actual worlds. We can't find multiverses, but we can find potentia in our actual experience. And that's one reason why you decide for this interpretation of quantum physics. Am I wrong about that? Uh, it, well, it, in the sense, so to speak, it's like an intuition that, that that when I, as a, as a complex anticipatory system and I'm driving my car and there is, and I could, you know, as long as I'm driving it uh, safely, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stay alive. But if I accidentally turn, tweak the wheel by uh, uh, five degrees at the wrong time, I, that's a pot. That, so, so there's alternative, uh, uh, there's alternative uh, routes uh, or, or, or landscapes of possibility. and. Uh, tweaking the wheel 10 degrees left at the wrong time, I, I'm dead. That pot, and, but yet, when I'm making a judgment between those alternatives. So the very fact I'm doing as a complex system, as I'm modeling the system, and as Robert Rosen described in his anticipatory dynamics book, uh, dynamically making choices between those alternatives, that helps me to drive more safely. And so in that, my intuition of that, that we're constantly involved with making choices and so forth. And I take those as real. Uh, it, you know, it may be that our constraints are such that we inevitably and almost deterministically, uh, you know, by habit, uh, that the, dominantly that we're quasi deterministic systems, but there's always some subset that which is real choice. And then I, uh, I then hypothesize that there's in, in conjunction with the understanding from quantum physics and the, the, uh, the the, the possibilistic interpretation we've heard today uh, that there is a ontologically a real uh, aspect uh, an order of potential as well as an order of the actual uh, and and it's sort of like a duality without dualism uh, there's the dual aspect but it's not it's not dualism i just have to jump in briefly uh, um to okay, say that uh, as a moderator, I have to leave to go teach um, a course that began two minutes ago, but um, I don't want to shut down conversation. Uh, so I'm happy to allow the room to be left open um, as long as uh, Tim, if you can continue to moderate uh, in my absence, if that's all right. All right, I'll, I'll let it go on for maybe uh, 10 minutes. We'll just see how it goes. But thank you very uh, much Matt, for your uh, yeah. leadership. Yeah, um, fascinating conversation. So much has been generated and I uh, can't wait to continue. So um, I will see you all in in a month, uh, those who can join us for session four. Uh, Anyone who wishes can stay on for 10 more minutes. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks, Pat. Um, Anderson, I just wanted to just quickly pipe in. I I, I, I loved your uh, your question and, and uh, 
just to circle back to what I tried to say at the beginning, which was just that, you know, at that point, it, at some point, all of this boils down to what you want the universe to be. You know, if, if you want the universe to be, to have some sort of coherent uh, structure so that, you know, there aren't little partitions where reality plays by different rules in different places, then you want, you want to see some sort of um, metaphysical, um, uh, if, if you discover something in physics, some, some interesting feature about how nature, uh, what the, the relations within natural systems under certain very specific circumstances, you would like to see how those relations might be exemplified more generally in, in domains outside of the, the particular circumstance of that experiment, i.e. you're on your way to maybe thinking that there might be a physical law underlying that particular uh, uh, um, experience, that's great. I mean, this is how science itself progresses. But then you can make the same move uh, just more generally by saying, okay, I've established what I've taken to be a physical law. Um, and I would like to see if maybe I can apply the basic notions, the basic categorical notions underlying that, that particular physical law and see if those categorical notions are exemplified beyond the locus of physics as a speculative move, you know, uh, but, but of course, unless you're interested in the universe being that way, you're not gonna make that move in the first place. I mean, presumably people who really believe in a multiverse, I don't, I've never met anyone actually who believes it as much people talk about it, oh, the multiverse. I've never met anybody who actually really believes that everything that can be must be and therefore nothing means anything. I mean, I guess if you're, you know, I guess there's people out there who actually believe that, but. I don't know anyone who who actually wants to live in a in a in a in a reality like that because it it robs it of, of meaning. But again, if you want reality to have meaning, then you're going to, I guess, begin asking those kinds of questions from that particular position in the first place. So I'm very white heading in that sense. I just think it's upfront. You say what you would like the universe to be, and, and if, if you want there to be some sort of coherence then you're going to look speculatively at how different, different experiences might be extended or different qualitative and quantitative features of experience, different regularities of experience might, might find their exemplification beyond uh, physics more generally. But again, it's just a speculative adventure, as Whitehead would say. I, I, that's the way I look at it. So I, I, really, I agree with Ruth that we need to be very careful when we, when we make those kinds of moves, because as soon as you invoke physics, there's an authority there. There's, you know, oh, my speculation has the imprimatur of physics now, and therefore there's some science behind the speculation. There's way too much uh, uh, loose uh, um, uh, talk, and uh, talk, but loose um, um, proclamation from the authority of physics, loose, proclam loose proclamations uh, uh, that, that I think we need to push back against uh, myself, but I'm not, but I'm open speculatively to the possibility. I just think those speculations should not necessarily be, um, be um, offered within the framework of some sort of scientific formalism when it's fundamentally speculative, unless you, unless you explicitly state that it's speculative at the beginning. That's, 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 that's the way I look at these kinds of questions. Oh, the matrix makes for good, uh, interesting movies. <laughs> Yeah, it's fun. It's wonderful. But I, what I worry about as an educator is that you have a lot of people who have no science literacy or very little science literacy, we're all living with this right now, who hear an authority tell them that the universe is such and such a way and, and, and people just automatically assume that, well, that's just science and I'm not in a position where I can even critically evaluate what I'm being told because I don't have a degree in quantum mechanics and I don't, I don't have a degree in mathematics but I'm watching this guy in the science channel telling me how the universe is, people, you know, that, that's, to me, that's, that's very dangerous uh, uh, if it's allowed to go un, unchecked. Because if you don't have people in a position where they can even ask critical questions about what they're being told about the world, then, um, you know, that's, that's not gonna be good for anyone down the road. Well, I think we're seeing that right now, actually. We're, we're in the middle, middle of what that can turn into. Uh, yeah, world, you know. The subjective elements gets brought out and certainly that, that component in the nature of the world but then in some movies uh this subjective component gets uh, amplified unduly or uh, remember that movie uh, uh what let's see what was the title uh, like <laughs> uh, that, that came out about 15 years ago 
that was emphasizing how quantum physics is so subjectivistic in terms of its implications. Oh, oh, what the bleep do we know? What the bleep do we know? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ask ask David Albert how he feels about that movie. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and his his participation in it. Yeah. That's that's an example of the kind of radical subjectivism that you avoid by the possibilist interpretation that both of you so you know clearly have brought out. Any other uh, comments at this point? Uh, anyone? Anyone who yeah, has spoken uh, before? Yeah. Comment? Follow up to May I make a comment? This is Tondaica. Yeah, go ahead, please. Tondaica, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. I'd like to start with Mike, with uh, Michael's comment that uh, reality is meaning. So long as the brain is functioning, reality is meaning because the function of the brain is to make meaning and manage the organism so that it can survive. <laughs> it's a brain management system. It's a management system. Um, Ruth, I was fascinated by your comments that transactional interpretation as a quantum is a quantum analog to brain science. That is McKeel Chris, the mastery and his emissary. Hmm. Now, I would like to invite Tim and the organizers of this wonderful conversation to bring in a brain scientist because the analogies are spectacular in terms of what the periaqueductal uh, gray area of the brain, the brain stem does, which is a convergence system. So that you have at the subcortical levels of the brain the operations of bringing together possibilities to consider which one the organism must act upon in order to survive. If you were to bring in a brain scientist, I worked with Jacques Panksepp, the founder of Affective Neuroscience for 10 years, he died three years ago. He would have been ideal, but one of his um, co-workers, someone with whom he's worked for years, Zarsha Narvarez, whom I've written an article with, she would be an ideal person to bring in to have a conversation so that you could, as physicists can see, not in terms of analogy, although it's analogical, you can see the striking parallels to what you're discussing, which would then ground the conversation beyond the field of physics and allow the extraordinary work that you're doing, Tim, to spread out into the world because it would break through some of the language that's being used here that would keep it in a cupboard that it should not be in because it's so revolutionary. So please continue, consider bringing in a neuroscientist who focuses on the emotions as a organizing system of the brain the emotional organizing systems of the brain and intuition in this way, as you know, we've talked about this, Tim, if we look at the German words, Gefühl and Anschauen, Anschauen pertains to conceptualization, but Gefühl, via Schleiermacher, referred to the nervous system, to feeling. Whitehead's philosophy of emotions is a, Whitehead's philosophy is a philosophy of emotions, it's an or philosophy of organism. So let's ground this because the world is in crisis and Timothy's work is magnificent and needs to get out beyond the way we can close ourselves in if we keep it only within our field. I have just the person for you, Tim. Yeah. Um, it's Gary Goldberg. Yeah, who, Gary, who yeah. Brought, yeah. Okay, who brought Ian McGilchrist's work to my attention. So if, if you want that, we can, we can chat later. Uh, he, he would be delighted to work with you. Yes, but my invitation here is to actually bring in a neuroscientist. To bring yeah, I, in a neuroscientist. I think he may actually be a neuro. I'm not sure. He he's a brain. Yes, if he if he isn't, yeah. we need to have a neuroscientist yeah, so that we aren't being analogical yeah. here. And yeah. then you'll see striking parallels to what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for your feedback on that, Tendeka. Uh, but please send me your recommendation from the neuroscientist. I will. Yes, uh, and and uh, what I've encountered by looking at that field is somewhat of a mixed bag. Uh, you've got a significant subset that I think are pretty much limited to actualism and Boolean only descriptions of systems and and, and a reductionist approach. Uh, and then you have a, a subset that I think are more open to the implications to complex systems understanding 
uh, and, and anticipatory dynamics and so forth that I've discussed in my book. Uh, and, and yes, by all means, I, I would hope that the neuroscience research community and uh, people that utilize that kind of input uh, can can develop in that way as you're describing to all Yes, because the there's a whole school of thought here that's doing exactly this. So that well, the parallels yeah. are absolutely yeah, striking. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Yeah. T Tim, uh, um, by the way, remind I, me. Sandek is in, in my book. I recommend her work uh, on affect uh, philosophical approach. Thank you. Well, it's gotten to be uh, like a quarter after one. Uh, maybe we should uh, close up shop here and let's.